everyone. It's fantastic to see so many um, people in the um, audience, so many familiar names. Um, what I want to do before we start discussing Bernie's book today is just say a couple things about um, the book series in which it's published. This is actually the third such author event uh, we've hosted over Zoom in the last few months. Um, and Corpus Juris, the Humanities and Politics and Law is a series that's published through Cornell University Press. Um, it's a unique series and that it not only features cutting edge scholarship in law and the humanities, but is run by a bunch of Cornell faculty. So our editorial board is also composed of Chantal Thomas, Jason Frank, Nelson Tebby, Aziz Rana, and Camille Robsis, who's now at Columbia. Um, and it's also sponsored by different organizations at Cornell. It's sponsored by Cornell Law School, the College of Arts and Sciences, and also by the Society for the Humanities. So I always like to thank those sponsors for making the series available in the first place. Um, we actually just two weeks ago published our fifth book, um, which is titled Disaffected, Emotion, Sedition, and Colonial Law in the Anglosphere by Tanya Agathakwias. Um, so you can stay tuned for that. Um, and before I introduce the panelists, I also want to thank Merhinder at the press for all of his help in organizing this and making this happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, he's been doing a lot of heavy lifting this spring um, with these, so we are truly grateful. Um, and what I'm going to do is obviously introduce, introduce Bernie to start out, and then I'll introduce each of the different respondents, commentators on her book before their comments, since I know the function of Zoom is to drop in and out. Um, and then we will reserve time for questions from the audience at the very end. Bernie's going to offer a response, and then I'll open the floor. And as you're thinking of questions, I'll, I'll mention this again later, there are two ways you can pose your question. You can either type it in the chat function, or you can raise your hand and ask to be unmuted and actually verbally pose the question yourself. So um, um, please keep questions in mind. Um, today we're going to be discussing Bernie Myler's Theaters of Pardon. We'll hear about that a little bit from our commentators. Let me first introduce Bernie. Bernie is the Carl and Sheila Spaeth Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for Research at Stanford Law School. And she's also a professor by courtesy of English at Stanford University. Her work focuses on the history and theory of Anglo-American constitutionalism, as well as law and the humanities. In addition to writing Theaters of Pardoning, she co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Law and the Humanities, which was published in 2020, and New Directions in Law and Literature, which was published with Oxford in 2017. Um, she's currently completing Common Law Originalism, a book about constitutional interpretation that is attempts to square fidelity to the founding era with fidelity to its common law jurisprudence. Um, she's also writing an introduction to the field of law and literature. She's a frequent media commentator on issues of contemporary constitutional concern. And this year she is, we have things to learn from her here, both a Guggenheim Fellow in Constitutional <laughs> Studies and a fellow at the Stanford Humanities Center. So we can feel jealousy. Um, <laughs> we also <laughs> anticipate hearing about her book. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first commentator. Um, and again, thank you so much for, for doing this today. Lorna Hudson is Merton Professor of English Literature at the University of Oxford and a fellow of the British Academy. Before coming to Oxford, she taught literature at UC Berkeley and the University of St. Andrews. And her publications include studies of 16th century prose fiction, Thomas Nash, published in 1989, and The Usurer's Daughter. She's also published a series of literary legal explorations, Rhetoric in Law in Early Modern Europe with Victoria Kahn in 2000, The Invention of Suspicion, Law and Mimesis in Shakespeare and Renaissance Drama, 2007, that won the 2008 Roland Bainton Prize, Circumstantial Shakespeare in 2015, and then in 2017, also another Bainton Prize winner, the Oxford Handbook of English Law and Literature. 
Um, she's currently working on a study of the overlooked Anglo imperialism of the Elizabethan idea of Britain entitled England's Insular Imagining. I'm eager to hear about this, but another time. Okay, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real thrill, a uh, real honor to be part of this. I've been an admirer of Bernie Myler's work for so long. So this is uh, just um, a great opportunity. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Now, I don't know what the convention is with comments, but what I'm going to do is refer to Bernie in the third person in my comments. And then when I ask questions, I'll address Bernie. So Bernie Myler's um, Theatres of Pardoning is a brilliantly accomplished and original achievement, both as a history of literary form and of political and legal thought. It traces a crucial shift in early modern political thinking from an image of sovereignty as um, personal and theological, the monarch like God on the throne of judgment, to an increasingly participatory vision of sovereignty as the collective power to rethink the polity, to forgive the past and refound the state. And this history is traced not through attention to political treatises or legal cases, but by attending to a literary form that has been largely neglected, uh, well, relatively speaking, neglected by literary critics themselves. And this form is tragic comedy, a form often disparaged in modern criticism, but which was clearly much favored in the 17th century because of the ingenuity with which it transforms revenge into reconciliation. And tragedy does this often, though not always, through a last minute pardon. And not the least of the contributions of Bernie's book is its revelation of just how per pervasive across England's revolutionary century were tragic comedies which featured pardons. She lists no fewer than 47 of them in um, an appendix to the book. And they even persist uh, into the 1650s when the theatres themselves were closed as she shows in a wonderful chapter discussing the work of the recently discovered dramatist, closet dramatist Cosmo Manucci. So our relative critical neglect, neglect of mid 17th century tragic comedy itself tells us that there's something that we as moderns have failed to get about what the early moderns were doing with tragic comedy. And what's so brilliant about the way that Bernie tells the story of this genre has to do with the way she make, it makes us rethink the relations of legal thought and dramatic form. Because this isn't just one of those uh, stories in which the role of art is mimetic, a story about how drama represents pardoning. Rather, Bernie recognizes that pardon itself is, has an inherently theatrical structure. And it is the fictional manipulation of this theater of pardon that enables new kinds of thought about political relations between sovereigns and subjects and citizens. So pardoning might seem prima facie, like the most obvious instance of sovereignty imagined as charismatic personal power, whether by an absolute monarch or by a president like Donald Trump. We think of the monarch sitting on the throne, the rebel or the felonious subject kneeling before him, or we think of Trump's 140 pardons and commutations for Steve Bannon and his pals. What could be more unequal? What could be more absolutist? But as Bernie's book shows, as a theatrical structure, the scene of pardon itself has revolutionary potential. Like Carl Schmitt's decision on the exception, pardoning serves to define sovereignty, but not as Schmitt's vicarious theological suspension of a mechanistic judicial norm. Pardoning, as Bernie puts it, unhinges the sovereign from a law that finds itself defined as positive insofar as it is posited apart from him. So pardoning theorizes, that is etymologically theorizes, theatricalizes or makes visible the relationship between sovereignty and the law. And that means it does so as part of a movement that shifts sovereignty from a judicial fiction to a lawmaking function through a theater that involves thinking about how law should work within a polity. So for me, I found that some really illuminating moves came very early on in the book where Ver Bernie distinguishes her conception of the sovereign pardon from that of Foucault, while also distinguishing pardoning, very importantly, from the mitigation of the law through equity, because equity is often associated with mercy and confused with pardoning. 
Bernie makes two essential and codependent points here. The first one I've already mentioned that the theatrical structure of pardon theorizes a relationship between political sovereignty and the law. But second, she insists that a pardon doesn't challenge the judgment that went before it. Unlike equity, which uh, mitigates the severity or the excessive leniency of the law by taking the intentions of both the accused and the lawmaker into account, a pardon doesn't pretend to judge or take account of human intentions. That's really interesting. A lot of criticism which concerns itself with the relation of law and literature gravitates towards the idea of equity because equity is, like literary fiction, characterological. The more we conjecture about intention, the more psychologically rich narratives become. But with equity, uh, Bernie argues, political thought remains stuck at the level of imagining the sovereign as sovereignty as judge. Whereas this theater of pardoning inaugurates a concept of the state as collective political judgment. Modeling the audience's judgment of the play on the form of the pardon enables us to move, and Bernie illustrates this from the prologues to Johnson's Bartholomew Fair, from judgment as verdict to judgment as political suffrage. So this whole book traces a movement from a judicial to a legislative model of sovereignty. So from these clarifying and generative distinctions, we get a history of theater and political thought from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure to Hobbes's Leviathan and beyond. There's a brilliant and thought provoking discussion of James I's imagining of the gunpowder plot as the tragic comedy of revelation. There are lucid analyses of the relation of pardoning scenes to parliamentary petitioning, royal clemency, and transitional justice in Ford's The Laws of Candy, Massinger's The Bondman, and Minuche's The Just General. Bernie also shows how Hobbes dismantles the jurisdictional distinction between the common law courts and the chancery courts, which was an incredibly um, sort of uh, crucial distinction. And Hobbes redefines all law as naturally equitable and dependent on sovereignty for its efficacy. By invoking pardoning in the service of reestablishment of monarch monarchical sovereignty, she says that Hobbes shifts the place of sovereignty gradually in the direction of parliament rather than the king. In a postlude, Bernie looks at what her pardon-centered polit political history might contribute to a rethinking of the place of forgiveness in liberal constitutionalism. Rather than seeing the pardon as the undemocratic residue of the king's monarchical power, a formal twin of Carl Schmitt's political theological sovereign is he who decides the exception, Bernie argues that the move from king as judge to sovereign legislator makes visible the complementarity of forgiveness and promising. And I think this makes her theater of pardoning correspondent to Victoria Kahn's romance of contract. I see them as sort of connected. Working again, working with uh, Hannah Arendt's treatment of forgiveness, Bernie suggests that a non-sovereign view of pardoning offers the potential to move beyond the impasse that pardoning faces within liberal constitutionalism. A potential, she says, that 17th century drama might help us realize. So that's my comments. That was my um, sort of summary. I thought it might help to get us, you know, moving that I summarized it a bit. Um, Bernie will tell me if I've summarized it wrong. <laughs> well, I've got three questions, Bernie, for you. I'm curious about what happens to the theological in your model. So Schmidt's model of decision on the exception defines modern politics as haunted by theology. Um, and similarly, the, the forum and in, in another context, equity is a sort of importation of the internal forum or the forum of spirituality and conscience into the secular sphere of jurisdiction um, by looking at intention, um, which in turn produces fiction. But pardoning is neither of these. It's relational, it's not decisionist. It ignores intention, it accepts the guilty verdict. So does pardoning simply redirect attention to law as human artifice, law and polity as human artifice and dispense with theology altogether? That's my first question. My second question is related and it's about improbability and extravagance. 
So these plots of pardon plays often draw from rhetorical exercises which specialize in sensationally improbable dilemmas, as you point out, sort of Seneca's declamations and stuff like that. So a lot of the laws seem kind of uh, crazy, like the law against ingratitude in Candy or beheading for fornication in Measure for Measure. So why I love the way you analyze Measure for Measure, I feel that there's something knowing and ambivalent in the fact that we know that this is a crazy law. I feel that ambivalence has played out a bit in um, Shakespeare's displacement of the culture's investment in female sexuality. He displaces that onto a sort of, on the one hand, onto jokes about Elbow's wife, and on the other hand, onto um, a sort of a sort of reading of Isabella as dislikable because she prefers her chastity to her brother's life. So I feel that all that makes um, makes the pardon seem easier to do, if you like. So that when you then say that James could have taken a leaf out of Shakespeare's book and pardoned the gunpowder plotters and therefore um, shored up his sovereignty, I I sort of can't, I can't see how, <laughs> I can't see how, because it, it seems that um, it's on a, it's co incommensurable with, um, you know. Um, so I've got one more question. Have I got time for one more question or should I fit? Right, okay, one more question. Now this is a very pedantic and annoying question, <laughs> this last one. Um, my final question is about the Greeks and the theater of pardoning. I think your suggestion that Aeschylus' Oresteia is a subtext for Measure for Measure, and you're pointing out the name Aeschylus in the play is absolutely brilliant. I've never heard anyone suggest that connection and it seems brilliant to me. And I think uh, you, drawing on Shakespeare's scholarship for Shakespeare's mediated knowledge of Greek drama seems really persuasive. But I balk a bit at the suggestion that Sir Edward Cook shared this um, sort of interest in Greek drama. And so when you say that um, he derives English common law from Greek and quotes Aeschylus, I feel that that link is doing a bit more work than it can bear because in the preface to the third part of the reports, Cook derives common law from Greek by invoking a sort of blend of Gaulfridian history, Geoffrey of Monmouth's Legend of Brutus, with some bits from Camden's Britannia, which he, he pinched from Buchanan. And both of them are part of an argument that makes England heir to the whole of Britain. This is my be in my bonnet at the moment, actually. Um, <laughs> on the one hand, uh, Brutus is a legend. He's supposed to have, you know, founded Britain. Um, on the other hand, Camden argues from Buchanan that Britons and Picts are a single Gaulish nation and they painted their bodies and they used Greek literature, the Greek letters and spoke Gaulish. So the point where Cook quotes Aeschylus is as part of this argument to prove that the Greek tor bretos means a picture. In other words, early Britons are the same as Picts because they paint themselves and they use Greek letters. So I feel this is all part of an argument that the English common law is so ancient and a Scottish monarch can't understand it. <laughs> so uh, this is part in my view of the problem of imagining that James could ever have reformulated the state or reformed it in any way. So that's my three questions. And thank you very much for giving me this chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorna. Um, fantastic comments. Um, I'll introduce our second commentator. Martha Minow is the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard University. She's taught at Harvard Law School since 1981, where she also served as Dean from 2009 to 2017. Her courses include advanced constitutional law, fairness and privacy, family law, international criminal justice, law and education, and law, justice, and design. She's an expert in human rights, constitutional law, and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and persons with disabilities. And she also writes and teaches about media policy, privatization, technology and ethics, military justice, and ethnic and religious conflict. He's the author of many articles and books, including When Should Law Forgive, published in 2019, In Brown's Wake, Legacies of America's Constitutional Landmark, 2010, 
between vengeance and forgiveness, facing history after genocide and mass violence, 1998, which was actually a big influence on my dissertation. Um, I haven't already told her this, but, <laughs> and making all the difference, inclusion, exclusion, and American law, published in 1990. And forthcoming in July of this year is Saving the News, Why the Constitution Calls for Government Action to Protect Freedom of Speech. Um, which you will also all be eagerly reading. So thank you. Well, thank you. It is such a pleasure to be uh, part of this fascinating discussion of a simply marvelous, original, and deep book, Theaters of Pardoning. I am so grateful to have read it both before and then after January 6th of this year, because our times make its themes all the more resonant. Notably, the book contrasts and connects pardoning as acts of a single leader, a king, and amnesty for acts of revolution. It shows legal authority and theatrical performance. It links reason and the cultivation of emotion and character. And it meditates over and over again on letting go of justified resentments. I don't just mean the resentments that some of us may have about Donald Trump. There are many sources of resentment, but it is hard not to have Trump come to mind as we just heard. Trump's own cannily ability to think about the theater and craft it, the personal dramas. He loved the power of the pardon precisely because he didn't need to consult or work with anyone else and he could turn the possibility of a pardon into global drama and political manipulation. He dangled it as a possibility as others faced prosecutions for assisting him. And he directed theatrics up until the last hour of his presidency over whether he would or would not pardon himself. How right of Professor Myler to wonder about the failure of the founding fathers of the United States Constitution to reconceptualize executive power as part of a constitutional democracy. How striking it is that South Africa, for example, directs that even executive pardons are subject to judicial review and must comport with the law. Here in the United States, I hope that a watching public is capable of expressing disapproval and protest over the corrupt uses of the executive pardon power. Myler gives us windows onto early modern and early Greek tragedy and comedy and reveals vivid productions that, and I quote, enabled spectators to safely rethink the foundations of the state. Don't we need to do that right now? Thrust into the dramas of grounded judgments, we are the groundlings, she points out. We are the foundations of society. I couldn't help but snap to attention with the recurring appearances in the book of King James. He's very much on my mind to a collaboration. I'm at uh, work with co choreographer Liz Lerman in her project exploring forgiveness and encircling this king who engaged in torture, who oversaw the production of the English version of the Bible named for him, who was obsessed with witches and who may have in turn influenced Shakespeare. The witches in Macbeth, for example, may have been inspired by James's book, Demonologies. King James supervised the explosion of witch hunting trials until he became more interested, as it turns out, in deer hunting. Last fall, a campaign launched for pardons for those convicted of witchery in the trials ordered by King James. The campaign seeks an apology to all those who are long deceased but accused and a national memorial as well. Clara Mitchell, the campaign's founder said, there should be an acknowledgement that what happened to these women was a terrible miscarriage of justice. She pointed out that in Salem, the Massachusetts town, the site of many infamous witch trial, witchcraft trials in the 1690s, Salem, Massachusetts issued a, a formal apology in 1957. 
to the 200 accused and 20 who were executed. In Scotland under James, then Scottish King, later King of England, 3,837 people were accused. Two thirds were put to death, but as yet there's no formal recognition. And so it's so striking 300 years later to see this call for pardon and commemoration. Myler explores the role of spectators and the significance of character and emotion. I'm struck that this role persists into the future, not just during current events. And how instructive this thought is for the US now as we confront such questions as whether the people who marched to the US Capitol on January 6th uh, and entered uh, with violence should be uh, prosecuted should be forgiven? Should those who marched and did not enter be forgiven? Should the Department of Justice forego uh, investigations into many misconduct deeds uh, under the prior administration? Should the presidential pardon process be restructured? Should there be truth and reconciliation processes for communities across this and other countries dealing with racialized violence? Myler juxtaposes revenge as a challenge to the body of the king and revolution as a challenge to legality and law giving. And I wonder actually about the merger across all those lines. Can people in a community forgive political violations by members of the community? Can that substitute for sovereign power uh, as Myler explores in Law of Candy and the Bondsman? Can forgiveness break cycles of revenge and violence? Uh, can pardoning become a component of rather than a dangerous supplement to the rule of law? It may not make for captivating drama, but in between the pardon power of kings and the capacity of community members to forgive one another are techniques within the legal system itself to let go of warranted blame. And these include commutations and expungements, but also something as boring as bankruptcy. Also discretion held by police, prosecutors, and judges. There's a worry that all of these techniques when used by the law undermine the rule of law, that they introduce discretion and they introduce bias. I think that's why we need a jurisprudence of forgiveness. We need to guard against bias and inequities. We need more scholarship and teaching about the subject. Another reason to so welcome this book. We need reasons for forgiveness. It's not just about emotion. I have two questions for Bernie. Can we learn from the theater that you describe also from debt forgiveness? Now, it may not seem as exciting uh, but forgiveness of debt is conjoined through history with forgiveness of crime, whether it's the biblical Jubilee or Solon's Code for Athens, or even Merchant of Venice, which intertwines uh, debt and some other kinds of harms. I've heard, in fact, that Shakespeare's father was so much in debt as well as Shakespeare's own indebtedness, and so debt appears across his plays. What attention to debt may offer is the transparent display of the interconnection of actions and causes beyond one person. The repercussion then of forgiveness across concentric circles of responsibility, across the lenders as well as the borrowers. Bankruptcy from ancient Rome to the present allows relief for through restructured payments or, or alterations in the credit worthiness of the borrower. Um, but that changes everybody's relationships. It may not again be so dramatic, but uh, I wonder if there's something to learn here about promises and breach and fresh restarting. My second question actually uh, turns back to this idea of the possibility of theater cultivating some form of character for a larger community. And I'm going to ask Bernie, can you imagine in this age of Twitter, some shared experience of theater that could cultivate some sensibility of forbearance, of understanding, of collective forgiveness? <laughs> 
Um, I'm having trouble doing so, but I yearn for it. And I also wonder whether it's possible to even create a setting that we share a narrative, share some understanding about what happened uh, and what could happen. Um, I think probably law is inadequate. I'm sure politics is inadequate. What we need are practices like practicing the skill of giving an apology, a real apology, uh, and practices like theater, sharing uh, the experience of watching and the catharsis. And for this and much else, Myler's juxtapos juxtaposition of law and the English stage are invaluable. Thank you, thank you. Um, I loved your reflections on debt, um, um, really marvelous. So let me go ahead and um, introduce our third respondent um, and then we'll give Bernie a chance to, to, to engage some of these provocations. Christopher Warren is Associate Professor of English and by courtesy of History at Carnegie Mellon University where he is also co-director of the Center for Print Networks and Performance his research spans law and literature, early modern studies, print culture, the history of political thought, and digital humanities. He's the author of Literature and the Law of Nations, 1580 to 1680, published with Oxford in 2015, which won the 2016 Roland H. Bainton Prize. He's co-founder of the Digital Humanities Project, Six Degrees of Francis Bacon, and is a member of the MLA's Executive Committee for 17th Century English. He's held visiting fellowships at Keeble College, Oxford, the University of Chicago, and NUI Galloway's Moore Institute. His articles have appeared in journals including Law, Culture, and the Humanities, the European Journal of International Law, English Literary Renaissance, Digital Humanities Quarterly, and Humanity. And his most recent work is part of an NSF-funded project called print and probability that focuses on freedom of the press prior to the First Amendment and uses digital technologies to identify the printers of clandestine early modern books. Um, also sounds fascinating. So I'll give the floor over to you, Chris. Uh, thanks so much, Liz. And um, wow, what a great honor it is to be here with you all thinking about Bernie's absolutely remarkable book. Um, who knew that our democracy would be saved by John Ford's The Laws of Candy. Um, in, in thinking about a response for today, uh, I remembered a strange connection between the US presidential pardon power and where I'm sitting here right now in Western Pennsylvania. Almost everything I know about this local angle comes from marketing materials for this Pittsburgh-based organic whiskey, which is called Wiggle or Weigel whiskey, depending on who you ask. The whiskey is named after one Philip Weigel, Western PA distiller and instigator of the so-called Whiskey Rebellion during George Washington's presidency. The companies wisely toned back their logo since the whiskey launched in 2012, but earlier iterations with a noose make clear that the drooping G, I don't know if folks can see it, the drooping G is meant to evoke a hanging man, which was Weigel's sentence for his treason conviction. It was only as a result of Washington's 1795 pardons that Weigel lived. Washington declared in his State of the Union address shortly thereafter, I shall always think it a sacred duty to exercise with firmness and energy the constitutional powers with which I am invested. Yet it appears to be no less consistent with the public good than it is with my personal feelings to mingle in the operations of government every degree of moderation and tenderness, which the nas national justice, dignity, and safety may permit. In so doing, Washington performed the seemingly unbounded Article II constitutional pardon power that theaters of pardoning thoughtfully traces back to 17th century British kings and culture. As I take it, theaters of pardoning advances a two-part thesis. The first descriptive, the second normative. And for any students here, basically it's what happened and what we should think about it. The descriptive thesis is that pardoning underwent a change over the 17th century from one grounded in the sovereign person of the monarch, with sovereignty primarily associated with the specificity of judgment, to one grounded in more general parliamentary lawgiving, 
Bernie's story is a, in part a story of what happens to the royal prerogative of pardoning through the emergence of liberal democracy. And it's through this transition that Bernie wonderfully accounts for the difference between a play like Measure for Measure, written at the beginning of the century, in which dramas, dramatizes the Duke's pardons in his sovereign monarchical capacity, and England's momentous act of oblivion of 1660, where the general pardon for revolutionary activities between 1637 and 1660 emanated not from the throne, but from the legislature. It wasn't the restored king, Charles II, who pardoned the revolution, it was parliament. The normative thesis, as I take it, is that both the royal road and the parliamentarian path are bad in their own ways. Arbitrary power lodged in a single person is ripe for abuse. Witness, of course, Donald Trump pardoning his allies and likely co-conspirators. That's an easy sell. But the late 17th century version that lodges the sovereign pardoning power in parliamentary law giving remains contaminated by the institutional jockeying for sovereignty. In Bernie's view, you can dress arbitrary power up in liberal talk of representation and rule of law all you want, but it's still arbitrary power. Between these poles, Myler teases out a third way, associated not with Shakespeare and Schmidt's royalism, nor with Hobbes and Kant's liberalism, but instead in the plays that dominate the book's central chapters, Ford's The Laws of Candy and Massinger's The Bondman plays whose tutelary spirit is ultimately Hannah Arendt, though with a small shot of Jacques Derrida as well. Get it? Spirit, shot, kind of a cocktail theme going on here. Um, so what give Ford, Massinger, Arendt, and Derrida the right flavor for Myler are their more private interpersonal versions of pardoning and forgiveness. And I think Martha put this well in her response as well. Versions in which pardoning isn't inherently connected to hierarchical structures of sovereignty, but is instead morally prior. A version where pardon isn't granted from above, but looks more like ordinary forgiveness among folks whose life circumstances require them to live together. Think French pardon rather than English pardon. As Bernie puts it in her final paragraphs, such a vision allows for the possibility of a drama in which citizens do not simply serve as spectators to the scene of sovereign forgiveness, but instead act as equals on democracy's stage. I have to say, I find Myler's descriptive account fascinating and entirely convincing. It's bracing to realize that from the perspective of the pardon power, the revolutionary parliamentarians lost the battle, but won the war. It had simply never occurred to me that England in 1660 took a more smaller Republican approach to the pardon power than the US Constitution. That's a significant observation, and there's plenty of proof though little comfort to the 50, 59 signatories of Charles I's death warrant excluded from the general pardon, many of whom were hung, drawn, and quartered or forced into permanent exile in North America. On Bernie's, on Bernie's normative thesis, I'm less sure. So I offer a few friendly questions and criticisms, mostly under two broad headings. First, what might be called pardoning's blackout politics, and second, pardoning's places. Bernie assesses pardoning on its relation to sovereignty, but I wonder about different criteria. I take it that Bernie finds Thomas Hobbes's view that pardoning is pragmatically strategic for a state trying to maintain order to be somewhat impure and instrumental. But in general, she's sympathetic with the Hobbesian project of peace. In line with the Christian narrative of grace, pardoning is a good, but ideally she'd wanna separate pardoning from worldly ends of securing sovereign control over domestic hearts, minds, and bodies. But what if pardoning and forgiveness weren't always already good? What if the supersessionist Christian framework that prefers turning the other cheek to an eye for an eye has blinded us to the idea that it might be better to remember injustice than to forget it? What if pardoning is theatrical in yet another sense, not explicitly explored in the book? a lie. To ask these questions is in part to mix in something like the 1619 project, created to unsettle comforting narratives, and also to reach back to the messy politics of April 1660 by way of the second edition of John Milton's Ready and Easy Way, which I've at least argued offers a perspective that can help us further think through the dynamics of transitional justice. So royalists 
in that moment were in search of support and legitimacy, and they were extending pardons as a coalitional olive branch to the group that, that I think of as kind of like the suburban soccer moms of 17th century politics, the Presbyterians. To frustrate that marriage of royalist and Presbyterian interests, Milton wanted to emphasize the ways that reconciliation could itself be a Trojan horse. Pardons might well be a trap. He wor worries aloud about the many-headed ideological network of monarchy, press, and legal institutions, nominally distinct from one another and superficially invested in tragicomic reconciliation, yet in fact bent on retribution. So I'm gonna read from Milton's ready and easy way here. He says, what will then be the revenges and offenses remembered and returned, not only by the chief person, but by all his adherents, accounts and reparations that will be required, suits, indictments, inquiries, discoveries, complaints, informations, who knows against whom or how many, though perhaps neuters, if not to utmost infliction, yet to imprisonment, fines, banishment, or molestation. If not these, yet disfavor, discountenance, disregard, and contempt on all but the known royalist or whom he favors. Nor let the new royalized Presbyterians persuade themselves that their old doings, though now recanted, will be forgotten, whatever conditions be contrived or trusted on. Let them but now read the diabolical forerunning libels, the faces, the gestures that now appear foremost and briskest in all public places as the harbingers of those that are in, expect in expectation to reign over us. Let them but hear the insolencies, the menaces, the insultings of our newly animated common enemies crept lately out of their holes, their hell, I might say, by the language of their infernal pamphlets. So Milton is skeptical about theaters of pardoning, and he wants to emphasize ways that the blackout politics of forgive and forget can be the cover for even further atrocity. Especially interesting, I think, are that Milton prominently rehearses the violent events of the Civil War on the assumption that the monarchy will never forget who fought against it. Why should the people? Nor could a pardon ever touch societal effects like disfavor, disregard, and contempt. To make a tragedy, Milton seems to warn, just take a tragic pardon and add time. A question I'd want to ask Bernie then is as we make our modern cocktail, why not more Milton, less Hobbes? Is Milton too bitter? In the 20th century, Ralph Ellison wrote poignantly of blues music as an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jagged grain. Milton illustrates that such views were hardly anachronistic to the 17th century and offer an historical alternative to drinking from the river Lethe. What I take to be pardoning's generally positive valence in theaters of pardoning also leads me to wonder about changing political contexts. Books as thorough and rigorous as this one take a long time to write. In my lifetime, the moment questions of punishment and forgiveness were most prominent in the US public discourse was the period after September 11th, 2001. The tragic attacks on the Pentagon and the Twin Towers helped justify retributive invasions, first of Afghanistan, then Iraq, underwrote criminal prosecutions, torture, and indefinite detentions in Guantanamo Bay. While Donald Trump is the only modern president mentioned, I wanted to ask to what extent theaters of pardoning might ultimately be a 9-11 or a Forever Wars book, or for shorthand, pardoning Osama bin Laden, discuss. Whether that pairing leaves us shaken or stirred, I mention it in order to try to probe the geography of pardoning, pardoning's places. Bernie's, Bernie's book is of course about the relations between Anglophone plays and Anglophone legal institutions, yet the plays she discusses are set in Vienna, Crete, Syracuse, and Sicily. If foreignness on stage is always really about domestic law and politics, what does that suggest about England's capacity to imagine international justice, to engage with foreign places as foreign places, as opposed to blank screens on which to project English or British laws and norms, even extraterritorial jurisdiction? How should we think about the relationship between pardoning and say extraterritorial criminal liability? Does the geographical reach of the pardon extend as far as the geographical reach of criminal liability or as far as US drone strikes? Would pardoning crimes of international terrorism seem overly sweet? 
If so, what prior relationships does pardoning imply? What contraband assumptions about kinship, citizenship, domicile, culture, race, and religion are we smuggling in when we talk about pardons? I take it as a given we would never call offshore tax havens pardons for corporations hiding their tax liabilities, or say that Donald Trump pardoned the Saudi crowdy prince Mohammed bin Salman for the extrajudicial execution of Jamal Khashoggi. But why? The functional impunity seems equivalent. I'll end with a twist from very recent history. In December, Trump pardoned four private military contractors who'd been convicted of murder and manslaughter in the 2007 killing of 14 unarmed civilians in Nisor Square, Baghdad. This pardon prompted stern rebuke from the United Nations. As its working group on the use of mercenaries announced, ensuring accountability for such crimes is fundamental to humanity and the community of nations. Pardons, amnesties, or any other forms of exculpation for war crimes opens doors to future abuses when states contract private military and security companies for inherent state functions. So Trump's theater of pardoning here is indeed very much as Bernie would suggest about performing sovereignty, but it's sovereignty reframed in a global context where sovereignty is jeopardized not by internal insurrection, but by the claims of humanity in the community of nations made concrete by treaty obligations under international law. We know that in the early modern periods, uh, legal pluralism, the royal prerogative faced competition not only from common law, but from several other jurisdictions, many of them with, with international reach, including ecclesiastical law, admiralty law, and treaties under the law of nations. So something I'd like to know more about is how pardoning in the globe, the theater, performed sovereignty for the globe. Okay, uh, that's it for me. The big takeaways, I think, are blackout politics and pardoning's places. Um, thank you very much for indulging my rye jokes. Um, Bernie, I look forward to sharing a wiggle whiskey with you when next we meet. Thank you so much, Chris. Fantastic questions and remarks. Um, we'll let Bernie take over the floor for a bit. I just want to begin by saying how grateful I am for these amazing comments and questions, which I've been uh, scribbling frenetically. So hopefully I've managed to capture most of what I was asked, but please forgive me if I haven't, I haven't completely encapsulated everything. Um, and before I begin responding to your particular questions and comments, I just want to express my gratitude to Liz Anker, who is a longtime collaborator for organizing this, as well as the wonderful Mahinder Kingra of Cornell University Press, um, for organizing this panel. Um, and I just want to say that it's been such a pleasure to have these particular panelists. Um, Lorna Hudson has been an academic hero of mine since she walked into a sparsely attended RSA session that I participated in as a grad student um, and offered trenchant commentary as she has on many other of my pieces since then. And I've long followed uh, Martha Minow's work on forgiveness in the international sphere and then have been very interested in her recent book, uh, When Should Law Forgive, which does connect this international arena with domestic concerns of debt forgiveness and juvenile justice. And uh, more recently, I've come to know Chris Warren through his fascinating accounts of the relationships among law, literature, and history in the context of the law of nations. So I'm just so, I couldn't be more pleased with having these particular contributions on my book. I'm so grateful. So I, I just wanted to begin my response by furnishing a little bit uh, of a window onto my book to explain how the idea for it arose. Um, when I was in graduate school, I found myself simultaneously reading large swaths of early modern drama and also reading about theories of sovereignty and the relationship between law and sovereign power. And I wound up being struck on the one hand by how many of the plays I encountered ended with, as Lorna mentioned, a final pardon or set of pardons. Um, and you know, these were tragic comedies, but they differed somewhat from the pastoral tragic comedies popular in late 16th century Italy. So I started to wonder why there seemed to be this cultural obsession with pardoning and why it came to be used as a generic device to make a play end happily. At the same time, and on the other hand, I noticed that pardoning seemed to be a function uh, 
uh, to function as a form of exercise of sovereign power um, in the political as well as the dramatic sphere, as many of the commentators mentioned, a form of sovereignty that many theorists, including Michel Foucault and Giorgio Agamben, had largely ignored. This led me initially to think that the representations of pardoning might shift from more monarchical and individual to more general and legislative over the course of 17th century England as crises in royal sovereignty came to a head. I then realized, though, that the story wasn't quite that simple because some plays did imagine this possibility of non-sovereign pardoning, pardoning divorce from a supreme power, whether monarchical or legislative, and coming from the people not themselves conceived as a sovereign people. So it was this democratic vision of pardoning that interested me most and made me wonder if our current skepticism about pardoning, a skepticism that I think I, Chris in a way ventriloquizes through Milton, but, um, but is also evidenced by the radical decline in exercises of mercy by governors and presidents over the past half century, um, whether this skepticism comes from its historical association with sovereignty. Um, and I think that, you know, as we saw with Trump, the association was cemented between sovereignty and pardoning uh, by interpretations of the president's capacity to pardon as plenary and coming out of a kind of kingly prerogative power. Um, and so what the book tries to show is the genealogy of that view, as well as the roads not taken in thinking about, um, about pardoning. And I would say also, I want to launch into thinking more about what's next after Trump. I think a lot of people are have been mentioning, you know, how do we rethink um, pardoning now? I think uh, Martha's book really deals with that um, and some of Chris's questions as well. Um, so in terms of the uh, particular uh, questions, which are just open up so many different um, avenues of exploration that are fabulous in general, um, you know, Lorna, I'll start with Lorna's question. So, what happens to the theological? And I think that um, the theological is just a crucial part of pardoning as you know, the sort of uh, James's interest in comparing the pardon by a king to God's pardon uh, of him demonstrates, right, that it's, it's along the analogy with a divine pardon that we even get this idea of sovereign mercy. So so there's always kind of God in the background there, I think. And I, I would say that then the other model of pardoning, this kind of interpersonal one, does invo involve a certain vision of Christianity on the one hand. But at the same time, I think to the extent that it's drawing from more of the Greek sources, um, it seems to also have a more uh, political and less religious quality, I think. And so I think that there's this tension in a way between the kind of divine authorization of the monarchical pardon and then this question of whether uh, interpersonal pardoning is part of a kind of emanating from a set of Christian values or whether it has this more political dimension of uh, entering into the polity and trying to reconstruct the polity. And I think maybe Arendt uh, sort of is the the more the less Christian you know version of of uh, the pardon there um, and a forgiveness in that context um, and I think that one other aspect of thinking about the pardon say today that's interesting is the real I, I think diminution of the rhetoric of pardoning in the religious sphere uh, and so the idea of mercy seems much less um, kind of prevalent in religious even accounts of law. Um, and I'm struck by, for example, say the difference between um, someone like Justice Scalia's account of the death penalty and then uh, what someone like Pope Francis has said about uh, death, the death penalty or other, other uh, religious figures and uh, other popes, that there is a kind of separation between a religious tradition that would emphasize mercy and then the way in which uh, that religion is interpreted within the context of a legal framework um, now. So I, that's on the theological part. Um, and then in terms of the uh, extravagance of a lot of these plots, yes, certainly the the laws of candy is kind of the most extreme, right? And, and you know, I, 
at least it doesn't mean candy as uh, you know that you would consume but i but the laws there are just these crazy laws of one of them is a uh you know a law of uh you know, they're based on these seneca controversiae and basically they're they're these moral laws that become generalized into uh actual laws and so i think that seeing measure for measure in that tradition is really interesting i hadn't thought of that exactly but i think that's exactly right that it's it's sort of uh enacting a moral law as a law of the polity and seeing what happens there and so there is this kind of craziness of uh the whole prosecution of uh involved in measure for measure and then it makes the pardons at the end seem inevitable because the whole idea behind the prosecution was so absurd. Um, so I think that that does kind of connect with this way in which these plays are serving as problem plays and are serving as plays that allow people to think without the without the danger of tragedy coming up, right? So that th there is this specter of tragedy looming over them, but not too seriously. And that the whole sort of staging of these crazy scenarios means that uh, tragedy you know, can be thought about, and especially moral tragedy uh, can be thought about without having necessarily the consequences of death or um, these extreme consequences. So I, I would say that I agree that that is a very specific aspect of these plays that they have these kind of crazy plots um, and that that makes the pardoning seem much more uh, more plausible. Now, turning though to James, because I think that this is connected with your point about um, James and whether it would be plausible for him to pardon the gunpowder plotters. And in a way, I think this is quite related to Chris's last question about, you know, would you pardon Osama bin Laden, right? That um, I think that this idea of you know, pardoning people who have threatened the state who are, I mean, in a way, the gunpowder plotters are the first terrorists in the West, um, that I, how, how do we think about that differently? And I guess I would say that I, you know, maybe it's not measure for measure necessarily that set up the possibility of that kind of pardon, but that I think that is a version of pardoning that's available that was available to James, that is available, that's what happened in the Whiskey Rebellion, um, that was something that, uh, you know, actually Washington sort of captured as a presidential power, as a power of amnesty, which I think maybe wasn't actually in the Constitution initially, um, but uh, he used that as uh, part of the Whiskey Rebellion, and I think that that's where um, it's that kind of pardon of the proto-revolutionary act or the terroristic act that um is maybe the core of a kind of political pardon or a political pardon power um and then finally in terms of the role of the greeks i think what you were mentioning is so fascinating and i definitely agree that cook is basically trying to you know, anglis, you know, make make uh, the law English, right? And and uh, exclude these other jurisdictions. I mean, I think part of his effort is really to exclude civil law and civil law traditions. Um, and I finally got to go to um, Holcomb Hall and look at his library after many years of endeavor. And it was so interesting because he has so many texts. He had so many texts of civil law and he had annotated them heavily, but he is so intent on trying to exclude them in certain ways from his jurisprudence. So it's really interesting to see kind of his engagement with these sources and then sort of self-conscious efforts to uh, push them to the sides or push them to the margins. And I think you were the one who kind of turned me on to where he could have even gotten the phrase uh, nomos koinos uh, Hel uh, Helenos, um, which was from this, uh, this, you know, Palantia Nova. And so he also had that in his library and had, you know, annotated a bunch of these kind of Greek sources. So, so I think that his engagement and, and he had engaged also with um, Plato's laws pretty extensively too. So he had some engagement with the Greeks, but often it was mediated through anthologies or as you're saying, through Roman sources rather than uh, entirely um, based on his own reading of the 
Greek materials. Um, so then turning to uh, to Martha's uh, questions, I mean, I think that you, you're, the answer to your question about can we learn uh, from this to think about debt forgiveness is uh, absolutely we can. And I think that uh, I wish I had engaged a little bit more with it um, in the book, but there, there are a lot of things to think about here. And I think that one way in which we can learn about it is that often we think about um, debt in a more collective way, as I think you've mentioned, and we think about the authorization for uh, forgiving debt more collectively, right? So we're imagining that uh, Congress could pass a law having to do with student loan reforms rather than that the president could kind of decide on uh, student debt relief. And I think that the place where this gets really uh, tangled and also developed a little bit is is actually in reconstruction and sort of in the wake of the civil war and with um, the reconstruction amendments and in particular in thinking about both the 14th amendment and then also um, pardoning in the wake of the american civil war um, because what happens in the aftermath of the civil war i think is that i uh, the supreme court winds up going along with uh, president johnson and agreeing that he has an almost you know, unlimited power to pardon the members of the former Confederacy, even though Congress has tried to take back that power because of the concerns about, you know, what those people are going to do in post reconstruction. Um, and what happens then is that the one time when that power is limited has to do with um, property and has to do with whether or not um, the president can uh, kind of reallocate property that has already vested in the treasury right so confiscated property from the war that's already um, vested in the treasury and then uh, the court says no actually that's the limit you know you can't congress is in charge of spending and and dealing with takings and so the limit to pardoning is really managing property so it has to be some other body that deals with that so i think that's where we have the possibility for reimagining pardoning actually in a more collective way, right? So if we think about debt and think about amnesty and think about amnesty in a more collective way um, along the lines of these acts of oblivion or historical amnesties, I think that's one way forward uh, in terms of thinking of a more democratic uh, kind of mechanism for um, thinking about pardoning. And then in terms of the uh, cultivation of you know, mercy or practices of pardoning um, in the age of Twitter and, uh, you know, all of that. I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and, you know, I haven't really engaged in uh, TikTok videos. I was talking to someone about like TikTok as a, as a medium for performance uh, recently, but, uh, but there, you know, each video has to be under a minute. So there's, really not as much opportunity for the engagement and then catharsis right there there's it's more based on it's based on memes and i almost think of it as like uh you know the the iphone pictures that are the picture live right you know, so that it, it's not really there isn't that opportunity for a reversal so where do we get that and i'm not sure i think that that's a great question and where do we get a shared um, understanding of uh, mercy today. I think that we need to figure that question out and I, I, I will keep thinking about what the answers might be for that. Um, and then just I, I finally, hopefully I'm not out of time, but um, I just wanna address uh, Chris's great questions too, which um, this question about pardoning uh, as you know, is pardoning a good thing, right? So normatively, is pardoning a good thing? And uh, you raise the uh, 1619 project um, and the difference between a kind of Miltonian and Hobbesian vision. So I think that the answer there for me is that pardoning forgiveness is good, but that it doesn't mean forgetting. And I think that actually the um, the case of uh, Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio is an interesting example there. I think um, Martha actually talks about him in her 
book, but what happens is that he is prosecuted for violating civil rights um, because he's engaging in these uh, stops of, you know, excessive uh, stops of Latinx, uh, members of the Latinx community, and he's prosecuted and then uh, Trump pardons him. But he's not happy enough with the pardon. He insists that the record has to be expunged. And so there was an elaborate back and forth judicially where ultimately the uh, Ninth Circuit affirmed that like he didn't get to have his record expunged just because he was pardoned. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting example where there's really a, a tension between remembering and remembering past harms and present harms and uh, and forgiving or moving on or figuring out some mode of reconciliation. And I would say that that's also an interesting aspect, I think, of a lot of the um, current discussions about, say, uh, renaming um, in a university context, right? So, so the uh, question of whether we should retain certain kinds of uh, names of people who you know engaged in discriminatory practices in the past. I was involved with one at Stanford where uh, we decided to rename features uh, named after uh, David Starr Jordan, who was a, a leader in the eugenics movement in the early 20th century. And one question that we got from people in the aftermath of that was, well, you know, where is forgiveness if you're insisting on renaming? But I don't think that it's not really about forgiveness or not. It's about kind of excavating a history and then deciding what you're going to do as a result of that excavation, right? So I think that we have to separate out the idea of forgiving and pardoning from the excavation of a historical record, which needs to remain intact or be reconstructed in a way that will make it intact. Um, and then I finally, I think, um, Oh, wait, I lost your last question. Um, oh, yes, the changing uh, political context. Yes, yes, I, absolutely. I think that the book is absolutely about uh, September 11th as well as about, uh, I mean, it's only coincidentally about Trump because I didn't I, I didn't have some omniscient prediction that he would arise, although it, it happened to be convenient to that, um, that it was published when he was president. But um, I think that, what you were asking about the geography of pardoning is super important there too, though, because actually the acts of oblivion that I talk about in the book, um, in a way, I mean, I think they go back to Scottish practices, but then also they wind up being something that's used in international agreements like the Treaty of Westphalia. And so that actually, I think at core, I read them as being almost international acts. And so that the acts of oblivion or then the tradition that then uh, becomes amnesties there uh, wind up, I think, being either moments of transitional justice in a kind of revolutionary setting or moments in an international setting and that those two are kind of close together, that the setting of international war and of civil war wind up being fairly uh, linked in that context and that um, that really renders that part of pardoning, I think, quite international at its core um, rather than just uh, coincidentally. So I think that there is this uh, interesting connection between the acts of oblivion and amnesty and the international arena that isn't encapsulated by simply a kind of royal view of pardoning. So with that, um, thank you just all so much for your amazing uh, comments and questions. And I'm going to have a lot to think about for a while. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, wonderful response. A uh, reminder to the audience, if you do want to pose a question, there are two ways you can do so. One is you can simply type one in the chat function, which we'll see. And then I'm going to momentarily read one out loud. Or you can raise your hand if you actually want to pose it verbally. Um, we do have one question in the chat, as I was saying. Um, so we'll simply get started with that. Um, this comes from Simon Stern. Hi, Simon. Um, <laughs> nice to see you in the list. Um, following on Chris Warren's question about sources of the pardon, might Bernie's book and this discussion 
also suggests that jury nullification is a form of pardoning, though presumably a much less theatrical form. Jury nullification is usually understood as a protest against the law, which the pardon is not taken to convey. Yet nullification, also often criticized as arbitrary, might be seen as expressing a kind of indifference to the letter of law in a fashion analogous to the point that the pardon does not opine on the legality of the person's conduct. Um, so would you wanna, um, as Simon is asking, think about parallels between nullification and the pardon? Yeah, I think nullification is a really interesting episode and actually it in a way is raised by measure for measure itself because there's a discussion about whether you know, a jury member might be more guilty than the person accused or how how they're thinking about their role. Um, so I think that the jury and especially, actually this also maybe relates back to Lerner's question because um, juries in the 17th century are sites for the exercise of conscience as Tom Green has explore that um, and nullification itself becomes this moment where uh, the conscience of the jury, which is a potentially religiously inflected conscience, gets expressed uh, in terms of the the legal and factual framework of the case. Um, so I think that there is a strong relationship between jury nullification and pardoning. I'm not sure if I would want to see it as part of the same thing because but I, I i think that there is a, a strong relationship i i the other thing that i would say just about the jury is that in thinking about how we might reconstruct pardoning in the wake of trump and i think what one thing to just note uh, post trump is that even though he issued so many prominent pardons that he didn't really increase the amount of pardoning uh, on the federal level. And so we still are in this moment where each president has pardoned very few people. Obama then at, at the end of his, uh, you know, in, in his second term, um, did more commutations and, and did a, a bit more with that. But in general, there's this kind of tr trend of waning pardon power. So how do we kind of re-legitimize a pardon? One way is maybe to think about a more bureaucratic model that would go back to the Office of Pardon Attorney and uh, the kind of routinization of pardoning. But then I have also been trying to think about, are there more democratic models? And one thing I've considered is, well, what about, what if you had pardon juries? What if you just had people, instead of having, uh, you know, a second, have a second jury and have them assess a number of cases, right? Almost like a grand jury, but just convene a pardon jury and then have them think about the exercises of mercy in these various cases. And then I think the advantage of that might be to say, well, okay, this is a way for people to weigh in on the legitimacy of different laws and how they are thinking about, you know, the carceral state or other, other aspects of the particular cases at hand. So um, that's one thought about how juries also could be involved with pardoning. Wonderful, thank you. I'm actually gonna jump in with a question. Um, um, so in listening to the comments and Bernie, also your response, I'm struck by the number of historical examples people have leveraged to kind of illustrate the power of the pardon or um, um, support their arguments. Um, and that makes me wonder first, if there's something about pardoning um, and what the pardon represents that inclines us to think about these very dramatic moments um, that perhaps organize popular consciousness, right? That kind of punctuate our collective memory. Um, and I think that that impulse that we've all had perhaps confirms your thesis, Bernie, about the, the theatricality and the incredible symbolism that attaches to the pardon. But um, I, I found myself also having a similar question that the panelists posed and perhaps especially Chris did, which is about, you know, how do we normatively evaluate pardons? Are they good things? Are they bad things? There's this incredible historical and maybe even cultural specificity to the pardon. Is there a way in which the symbolism that attaches to pardoning actually prevents us from trying to come up with a global theory of 
you know, a normative account of the value of pardons versus forgiveness and other mechanisms. Um, so I'd love to hear you weigh in more on this symbolic function and how it perhaps interacts with our desire to have a, um, a normative theory of the pardon. Yeah, and I mean, other people should also feel free to jump in if you have thoughts about this, but I, I think that it is really interesting to think about the sort of dramatic versions of pardon versus the non-dramatic versions. And, you know, my book mostly focuses on the dramatic version. So that's kind of a gap. I'm not really dealing with the, the run of the mill and routine pardons that were happening in the 17th century. Um, but I think if you do sort of place the two things together, um, it's really interesting to see the dynamics of, you know, how many people wind up being pardoned as a kind of routine matter that we never hear about, right? Whereas we're uh, thinking a lot about these things like the Whiskey Rebellion or about uh, the uh, Act of Oblivion. So that it's, those aren't prominent. And I think the reason partly we think that, oh, Trump abused his pardon power and he used it so much is because almost all the pardons he issued were these theatrical pardons rather than being any, I mean, there were maybe two uh, run of the mill pardons and those were all uh, prompted by celebrities anyway. Um, so there's this question about, you know, what is the function of the pardon then? And I think that that does get back to Chris's normative question. So there are a couple of different thoughts about that. Um, so one would be, you know, the pardon is a way to mitigate un cruel laws, right? So uh, I think that that was one of the functions, say, in the 16th century, uh, Naomi Hernard has done a great job in uh, the King's Pardon of showing how uh, the court, how basically manslaughter was treated differently than murder through the pardon process, right? So it's a way to change legal regimes that aren't thought to be universally fair for all. Um, I would say that Thomas Jefferson also said, thought something similar about the pardon. He tried to eliminate pardoning from the uh, Virginia Constitution because he thought that in an enlightened criminal justice system, you just wouldn't need pardoning, that we should reduce the number of, or that they should reduce the number of crimes punishable by death, but that once that was achieved and once there was an enlightened criminal justice system, pardoning wouldn't be necessary. So then there's another account which would be saying, well, pardoning serves a function maybe somewhat similar to equity, right? So if equity is a way to uh, think about the individual case during the process of judging, pardoning also allows for thinking about the individual uh, after judgment or in a different context. So that that would be another function. Um, then there's the function of uh, kind of reanimating sovereignty, right? So that, that's the one that I'm critical of, but I think that that's what uh, a lot of the theatrical pardons have actually, you know, are, are designed to do, right? I think that that's part of the purpose of Trump's pardons is to kind of create a, a guise of sovereignty. Um, and then there, I think, is another uh, set of normative reasons which have to do with transitional justice. So that I think that there's, and, and this has come up in a couple of different remarks, that uh, there's the question of whether, you know, acts that we might condemn or might not, um, but acts uh, that occur during a situation of war or some other context that is similar should be treated with equal harshness as if they had occurred at a different time. And also whether, and, and that's where also, I think there's the instrumental part. I think Chris reads me as saying that, I think that that version of pardoning is too instrumental. I actually don't think so. I think that that's, that idea of pardoning as being part of reconstructing a polity and making sure that, uh, that the future is open is a really important part of pardoning. And I think that that aspect, I would say that that aspect of pardoning also can be important within the domestic context too, not just in the context of transitional justice. So that pardoning for a future, for um, the ability to move forward in a more positive way as a polity, I think would be another 
normative justification for um, pardoning in the contemporary uh, moment. So, yeah. Does anyone from the um, uh, the other panelists want to weigh in since that was kind of a big question? We have one. Oh, I think Martha was going to say something. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, just a muting. So as you know, such a big question and such an interesting one. I do think as Bernie suggested, there's a political dimension of forgiveness. Then it can be not just after a war, but you know, I do think about Ford's forgiveness of Nixon as a political decision to allow the country to move on. Now, the question is whether that puts someone above the law. And I know I was furious at the time, I'm old enough to remember it, but in retrospect, it seemed of a piece with Ford also extending amnesty to Vietnam era protesters. And so this political uh, use of letting go of justified resentment, right? That's, that's what forgiveness has to be. And it's letting go of justified resentment. Um, whereas the pardon power is often used quite specifically to overcome what seems to be an injustice. So it may be that there's not justified resentment. You know, the framers of the constitution who did want to keep the pardon power thought that there could be abuses of the courts and there had to be ultimately a political check on the abuses of the courts. So I think that the under, I think there's already a, a emerging an explosion of work on political forgiveness partly inspired by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and the kind of proliferation of transitional justice mechanisms, but partly with the recognition that there's a similarity to, but differences uh, when compared with the interpersonal. Fantastic, we have one anonymous question. Um, 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 Bernie, is there a modern judicial figure who you'd want to think of as being especially sympathetic with your understanding of pardoning? Um, I mean, and maybe this is also an invitation for you, right? The book is about the early modern period and about trauma. To what extent would you want to or have you thought about extending its arguments either to contemporary literary forms or, um, I mean, obviously you thought a lot about its political relevance to today, um, but, but would you wanna extend it to contemporary literature or literature from other periods? Yeah, I think that I, it's a really, I, I saw the question in the chat and I was thinking it's so interesting because I don't feel like most of the judges who we think about a lot in the constitutional context have really weighed in that much about um, pardoning in particular. I, I think that when I was reading some of the cases uh, having to do with Arpaio, uh, there was an interesting um, district court opinion sort of distinguishing between uh, the role of you know the record versus the role of pardoning. And I think that that was an important kind of clarification of what the respective functions are. But I feel like the Supreme Court itself has really not been that active in recent moments uh, in terms of thinking about pardoning, which is itself maybe uh, an interesting phenomenon. Um, and I guess in terms of the contemporary literary context, I think that I've less been in, uh, sort of reading about forgiveness or, or pardoning in that context and more thinking about the role of memory and forgetting. And so um, something like uh, uh, Ishiguro's The Buried Giant, I think of as really interesting in terms of the role of past conflict and whether there is something in between uh, revenge and memorializing past conflict and reanimating it and complete forgetting. And, you know, in that context, there's the uh, mist of forgetfulness that kind of goes over people versus the uh, the the 
you know, very giant itself. So, so this I, question of like, is there something in between? Um, and that's where I would see also some forms of forgiveness or pardoning functioning as part of that um, in between. Fantastic. Um, and then we have one, but I think it'll probably be our final question from Amalia Kessler. Um, Bernie, this is far removed from your book, um, but I remember reading a while back that Sarkozy was refusing to exercise the pardon power he had under the French constitution. So any thoughts about how pardon power is understood in Europe or elsewhere? Um, I think also getting to the cultural specificity of the pardon. Yeah, so I, I actually didn't know about that, which is, it, it's a really interesting phenomenon. I want to hear more about it. But one thing that I've been quite struck by is the way that um, amnesty and pardoning are much more distinguished in European context than in the American context. And so uh, in under the German constitution and under French tradition, uh, the legislature has the power to grant amnesty. Um, but the, you know, a, a kind of executive figure, whichever, uh, in depending on which constitutional context it is, has the power over pardoning generally. And, but at the same time, you know, as I think Lorna was mentioning that, that there, or, or Martha, that there are these greater limitations, I would say, on the power of pardoning under other constitutional contexts outside of the American. And again, I, I see part of the maybe excessive expanse of pardoning in the American context is coming out of the post-Civil War moment when the Supreme Court, I think, really overreached in terms of its interpretation of how capacious the president's power was and said, well, the president has the power over amnesty as well as pardon. Amnesty and pardon are, you know, the same thing, basically, that uh, they're both included under the pardon power, which I think, you know, reading the words of the Constitution, you don't get that. It's just uh, through this, uh, I think, overreaching interpretation. But so I would say that in general, in the European context, there's a, a, a different attitude towards pardoning, and maybe partly out of a desire to tamp down the potentially monarchical associations, right, that uh, amnesty is a legislative process, and that it's not, um, it's not just given to a president or a prime minister. Thank you. Um, so I think we will sign off and bid farewell. Um, thank you, Lorna, Chris, Martha, for um, fantastic comments. Um, they were so rich. And Bernie as well for um, a wonderful book and such a great response. Um, um, and Mahindra, thank you so much for organizing this um, and helping with that. So um, um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all. And this will be recorded. So if you want and made available, so if people want to share it, um, we can be in touch with the press and, and get access to that too. Okay. So anyway, thank Great. you everyone. Thank Have you. a wonderful day. Good luck with this everyone. final cruel thank part of the semester. Thank you. Everyone. Good to see you all. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations. It was wonderful. Thank you. This was so fun. Yeah, thank you.